Bye, that's in an hour. First on BBC Two, we're back looking up to the stars down under. We trekked for hours into the Australian bush. In search of some of the most beautiful sights our planet has to offer. We've come to a place of amazing scenery. And unique wildlife. But where we're going, the true beauty only comes out when the sun goes down. Because crowning all this is a glorious night sky. Welcome back to Australia. It's 6 a.m. here. Uh, this is our home for the last few days at Siding Spring Observatory, perched on Mount Wirt, <laughs> Southeast Australia. I'll tell you what, perched on a mountain is the right thing because although it's not raining now, yeah. it's blowing a gale. It's absolutely. None of these are the clothes I'd like to present a television show in. <laughs> Freezing right? cold. Well, I didn't bring any warm weather clothes because, <laughs> hey, come to Australia. You'll go surfing, go to a barbecue. We've been missold this trip hideously. This, by the way, is what the <laughs> site looked like earlier on in the day when we're just getting the edge of Cyclone Debbie and essentially this all got washed away. So <laughs> yeah. at least we're here now. And actually the one good thing about the wind is of course, well, it's blown away the clouds, and so we've got a beautiful, clear view of the night sky. Here is the live view. Now, look at that. It's utterly beautiful. The, the Anglo-Australian Telescope, the Southern Cross, the Milky Way, so plenty more of that later. By the way, Dara asked me to apologise on his behalf for his coat, because he said, I never thought I'd wear this on Why would I wear this on I had to borrow. <laughs> I had to borrow this from Australia's <laughs> National University, which is... <laughs> That's all that's on that, by the way, I could say something else. <laughs> uh, as well as views of the sky, here are some of the critters we've been sharing our mountain with. Some people on Twitter are very excited about this. Big hello to Robert Pattinson, who was very excited to see all these kangaroos. Oh, wait, no, was he excited to say, why are you wasting your time showing kangaroos? I think he pointed out that it was definitely a natural history show being interrupted by the astronomy. This is true. Uh, they do, however, the wildlife does interrupt the astronomy anyway, because uh, <laughs> yeah. there's loads of, obviously, lenses staring up at the sky here, and the wildlife tends not to leave them alone. Inventing entirely new constellations, this one's called the spider, only available to see here from Siding Spring. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you at home have once seen the uh, bird's legs. That's another particularly nice uh I should say, these are our, our telescopes, there so our is. camera's looking at the sky. And so, my yeah, favourite one, by the way, one of the, the most ancient and beautiful constellations, which is Frog's Bottom. Uh, <laughs> yes. And uh, that's, that's one to work keeping an eye out for. Uh, on our last day here, we'll be sharing more of the adventures that's taken us across the entire continent. Tonight on Stargazing. Liz will be asking why ancient rocks in the outback could help us find signs of life on Mars. If alien civilizations are out there, we'll see why an Australian telescope might be the first to spot them. We'll explore what's been happening with the black hole at the centre of our galaxy. Plus more results from your hunt for objects in the far reaches of our solar system. Actually, the, the Planet Nine results, we're going to discuss them later. They are, they are interesting. As, as I emphasised on Tuesday, it's real science, this, and we have real science to talk about. We've had, I think, about four million hits so far. So it's the, the, the most number of views that we've ever had in all the seven series of stargazing. So thank you for that and carry on. But once again, we're in a race against the growing light here in Australia. Sunrise a little over an hour away. The time here says is about, what are we, about four minutes past six here. Uh, yeah, and minus 28 degrees. Yeah, OK, can you see my breath? Uh, you can send in your questions. And this, by the way, the fire was a prop two days ago. <laughs> yes. It's not a prop anymore. Uh, you can send in your questions <laughs> and photos via Twitter and the website, bbc.co.k forward slash stargazing or hashtag askstargazing. <laughs> yeah. Bbc.co.k whatever. Yeah, you know what it is. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, here that we got in from Shagor. Very quick answer. Where does all the matter in black holes? Where does all the matter the black holes absorb go? 
Oh, well, it falls into the black hole. It, it, it stays there, essentially, but we think that black holes evaporate. This is what Stephen Hawking is most famous for, Hawking radiation. So in about one with 100 noughts after it years, it will be, presumably, returned to the universe again. OK, fine. Uh, the sky is looking great, particularly away from all these lights here, which is where mm. Liz is standing. Liz, what can you see at the moment? Well, <laughs> we've come <laughs> down from Mount Warrus a little to get out of this howling wind, which, to be fair, has calm down a tiny bit. It's freezing cold though, which is why I look like Michelin Man uh, this evening. Um, but we don't care because it's glorious above our heads, isn't it, Greg? It's magnificent. It's just another stunning night and we're delighted that we can bring this to you on our last night. Greg Quick, of course, our resident guide to the Southern Skies is with me. And just take a look at this image we got with our telescopes of the jewel box cluster. Look at that. Now, Greg, this is a magnificent sight. Uh, where is the jewel box cluster and what is it made up of? It's one of my favourites in the sky and it's right there in the Southern Cross next to Beecrux. OK, so it's very close to the Colsac Nebula is. that we spoke about a couple of nights ago. That's right, Colsac Nebula's right in there. And how many stars in it? Oh, look, there's at least 100 in there. If you look at it with a pair of binoculars, there's 100 different coloured stars, which is why they, it's called the jewel box. Uh -huh. They're about 8,000 light years away. And it's the sort of thing that, you know, this, the galactic open star clusters, of which this is one, they're like the, the villages and the towns of stars. And this one's probably a little bit bigger than a little village. It's, a, you know, more like a small town. And they're incredibly colourful. They are. The colours in them are, are beautiful. They, you know, we've got the red, which tells us that the stars are cooler. And the, the hotter ones are white or blue, which sounds a bit counterintuitive until you... Think about heating up a piece of iron and it goes red hot first and then it goes white hot. See, that makes sense. Yeah. That's a fantastic description. Mm. And another beautiful description, of course, is the one that Herschel made when he first saw the jewel box. He described its appearance through the telescope as a superb piece of fancy jewellery. It really is, isn't it? Oh, and it's, it's magnificent. Yeah, it's lovely that our telescopes could pick it up for, for us tonight. Um, another feature of the Southern Skies I've really been looking forward to seeing, of course, is the Carina Nebula. And here's an image of it from one of our telescopes. Can you believe this is what we can capture down here? It's so bright and it's so big, isn't it, Greg? Well, we've got it up just over here in the sky at the moment too, that little bright knot so in the Milky Way. So it looks to the naked eye like a lovely, soft, hazy mass. That little, yeah, the brightest piece of the Milky Way right there, that's yeah. the Eta Carina Nebula. Yeah, yeah, and then you use a telescope and, and this image comes up. It's just spectacular. Yeah. So describe it for me, Greg. Well, it's incredibly rich, this particular nebula. It's got... It's got stars embedded in it, which it would have been born out of that nebula. It's got bright nebula. It's got ionised nebula, which is you can see in the colour in there. There's electrons being knocked off molecules in there, so that gas has been turned into a plasma state. There's just so much going on. And, and then it's this huge nebula that contains within it another nebula. Now, we can't pick it that does. up with our telescope. It's seven and a half thousand light years away. But take a look at this Hubble image to see what I mean, because I really want you to tell me oh, yeah, this what's one. going on here. That's yep. just an incredible image. So this star is called uh, Eta Carina itself, and it's embedded in the Eta Carina nebula. Right. 150 years ago, this was the brightest star in the sky. And it had this massive outburst, and it's thrown out these lobes of material. Yeah. And and it's obscured the light from Look that star. So and that's now, why it's called the homunculus nebula, well, two sort of lobes around this star, which are not yeah. yet fully, un fully understood, um, but it's all this dust around it. It, it. It's just really incredible. But can we just leave you with the image that our telescopes captured of the Carina Nebula, yet another mesmerizing sight in the southern skies? Beautiful. planets of our galaxy, but it's also perfectly placed to receive transmissions or messages or any information that might come from, our, totally from out see, there. I'm and lots of you have been asking about aliens and alien forms. Tor from St. Bede's Science Department yeah. says, how do scientists look for life on other planets? Well, one way we can go there, so in particular, for example, the Viking probes that landed on Mars in the mid-1970s. The other way, though, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, is to analyse the light from stars that passes through the atmosphere of the planets. And that allows you to look into the atmosphere and see what the atmosphere is made of. Look for signs of life like oxygen, which is put into planetary atmospheres in large concentrations by photosynthesis. We're going to talk about that actually a little bit later on. OK. There are places in Australia, though, where the idea of alien life is taken very seriously indeed. Just as usual, 
and it was around about quarter past eight in the morning. Doug Moffat is an amateur astronomer with a story to tell. When I looked in the distance, I saw a, a black object hanging silently and very still in the sky. I had no explanation for what this object was. He's been investigating UFO encounters for the past 20 years. Wycliffe Wells' UFO history goes back to the Second World War during the 40s when servicemen based at Wycliffe Wells saw repeatedly objects that they could not explain. During the last 70 years, there have been hundreds and hundreds of sightings in this very remote part of Australia. You might wonder why aliens seem so keen on an isolated part of the Australian outback. Why Wycliffe Wells is a very interesting question. It's so flat here and there's so, well, there's no light pollution. There is nowhere for ET to hide. The likelihood of us confirming ETs probably largely depends on whether science gets on board and treats this subject as a real science and starts doing some real investigation. Well, there's good news for Doug. The hunt for alien life just got serious. And another remote part of Australia is in pole position to spot it. Seems like an awful waste of stars and planets if, if we're the only intelligent life in, in, the, in the universe. Australia is very fortunate in that the centre of the Milky Way goes literally over the top of this dish every day. The centre of the Milky Way is where most of the stars we can see are and where alien life may be. Professor Matthew Bayliss is part of a coordinated global effort to find alien civilizations. And while he doesn't think they've made it to Earth in person, there are reasons to be optimistic. In 2007, this telescope picked up a mysterious signal. I remember that night I couldn't get to sleep. I was so excited. This thing was both so loud and so incredibly far away that it must represent a new phenomenon. This intense pulse, later dubbed an FRB, or fast radio burst, was a complete mystery. And a complete one-off. Until six years later, when another 10 signals were detected. We know that they're coming from enormous distances in the universe. And the amount of power that they m require is something completely incomprehensible to us and we thought was almost theoretically impossible. Impossible signals prompted impossible explanations. I think the most radical theory is that if aliens are using radio waves to propel spaceships across the, the galaxy, that during the short, intense burst of radiation that they use to propel them, that would generate something that looks a hell of a lot like an FRB. I think it's a pretty nifty idea, and the fact that we've been detecting these things that maybe aliens were like launching spaceships is it's pretty cool stuff. Although Matthew is yet to be convinced by the alien spaceship theory, a new urgency has taken over the global effort to find alien life. It's time to commit to finding the answer to search for life beyond Earth. Physicist Stephen Hawking has teamed up with a wealthy Russian entrepreneur in the $100 million Project Breakthrough Listen. And as its first step, Matthew has kicked off the biggest search for alien life ever undertaken. This telescope will search far deeper than we've ever done before. A million stars in total will be surveyed for alien transmission. There's going to be a supercomputer in that tower, which is going to divide the, the spectrum into a billion radio stations that we're listening to. It's not a guarantee of success, but it's certainly going to be so much better than anything we've been able to achieve before. And there's no one more eager for Matthew to find answers 
then Doug Moffat, back in Whitecliff Well. Never saw the object again. Uh, and never seen anything like it again. To this day, I'm not really have any explanation as to what that could be. Given the immensity of the universe, we're certainly not alone. Just got a great tweet from uh, Paul Rowlands. He said, you can almost hear Prof Brian Cox grinding his teeth during the UFO bit. Yeah, you could, actually, from yeah. here. Uh, <laughs> we've had lots of your questions on the subject of alien intelligence. Both Pam and Bowie asked versions of, somewhere in the infinite universe, if intelligent life is watching, is it more advanced than Dara and Brian? It's, it's actually a good question. I mean, the, the point about alien life is you have to define um, what you mean. Are we interested in microbes or are we interested in civilizations? And I think when, we, when we're talking about contacting aliens, you really have to confine yourself, I think, to the Milky Way galaxy. It's clearly true there'll be civilizations out there amongst the galaxies, two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, but they're too far away. So I don't think we'll ever contact a civilization should they exist from beyond our galaxy. So think about the Milky Way. We've been looking at it all week, that vast sort of island of, what, 200 billion stars. The, um, the evidence is that many of them have planets around them. The, the current estimate is something like 20 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy. That's one in 10 stars that you can see in the sky. That's a lot of homes for life. So if you ask many astronomers, I think the answer tends to be, we're optimistic that there may be civilizations out there, and that's why we do the science you saw in that film, the real science with radio telescopes looking for signals. However, what's interesting is you ask biologists, and they point to the fact that on this planet, the only one we know of to harbor life, it took four billion years from the origin of life to the rise of a civilization, for our civilization to emerge, a third of the age of the universe. So that might suggest that whilst life may be common in the form of microbes, and indeed we, we look for those on the, on the moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, the idea that, that it takes so long, or it did here at least, to go from simple life to complex life and then civilization, suggests that we might be a very rare phenomena in the Milky Way galaxy, and therefore I would add a very valuable part of nature indeed, and something that's worth preserving. And even if we find microbes on um, Enceladus, let's say, the, yeah. uh, and microbial life. Would it be from the same root as we are, or would it have independently well, emerged? You mentioned Enceladus, actually. I think we've got a photograph of Enceladus from the Cassini probe that we were discussing last night. So it's a fascinating moon. It's about the size of Wales, so it's a very small moon. But you see at the bottom, at the south pole of Enceladus, there's something interesting happening. There are these jets, which are actually jets of water ice that are erupting from the surface. Those are volcanoes of ice. And that strongly suggests there's liquid water below the surface. And that suggests the conditions that are at least sufficient for life may be present below the surface of that moon. So it's a very beautiful thing. What would be more remarkable if, if we found microbes there and they were of the same root of life as we are and may have been seeded from Mars, let's say? But it's an interesting question. I mean, there's a, there's a theory called panspermia, which points out that material is spread across the solar system. So, for example, we have Martian meteorites here on Earth. So could there have been an origin of life off the Earth, on Mars, perhaps, or on comets or something like that? And could that have been distributed throughout the solar system? We'd have to go to Enceladus to plan to do this, fly through those jets, see if there's anything there, and then you check whether the DNA was the same, the biochemistry was the same and such. But I've got a question for you, actually, because I know you were looking earlier. And, um, let's imagine we did, with the radio telescope, contact a civilization. What happens? Is there a protocol? Yes, there is, and I've read it, uh, and it, uh, it's a <laughs> yes. lovely read. It's Article 11 <laughs> of the Treaty on the Principles Governing the Activities of States and the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including Moon and Other Bodies. <laughs> yes, uh, I've and, that written down on yes, there. No, I left that off. <laughs> uh, don't watch my eyes go side to side. Um, but it is it's quite interesting because the gist of it basically is about eight paragraphs, of it, but the first four are, whoa, there, check your results, uh, and check them again and make sure it's, it's definitely eliminate all possible things. Then it gives a list of numbers to call, including... <laughs> well, like, like 0800. The, Essentially, there's people you've got to register Premium with. Phone yeah, rings. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and like the IAU and these people like the International Astronomy, Astronomy Union and the UN, yeah. you've got to call the UN. And then they'll, they'll let you announce it. But the big thing, and point number eight, the final one is don't reply. Until everyone else has decided what the reply is going to be, 
do not reply can, to it can contact. I can see that's sensible for a radio transmission, but what if, what if an alien sort of walks up to you? What do you do? You, you shun them. You shun them. You, you, like, <laughs> this, I live in London. Or I'm on the tube. If somebody shunned them, you just, you, 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 we're used to this. You just don't talk to them. <laughs> I don't you're, know, what, I don't know northern, why they walk like that. You but... northern types are too friendly. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're quite harsh with that. Now, <laughs> something you can see all the time uh, in, the, in this part of the world is the Southern Cross. We've live pictures of it now. Uh, the, uh, it is the constellation oh, yeah. which is just, it's iconic in this part. It's on the flag of Australia and I think four of the countries. There's a pub quiz question for if you can name them. Uh, but it's enormously significant to indigenous cultures, as Gilar Michael Anderson of the Wallier explains. The Southern Cross um, is an important place for us. Um, it tells us the story of um, the pathway to what we call Bulimal. Bulimo is sky camp or heaven, as they call it in the Christian world, where Baimi, the creator, lives. Baimi realised that in this kulibar tree that's sitting by the Warramburu Milky Way, he saw these five white cockatoos sitting up there. And um, so he, he told them, no, this is a good idea. You, you stay here now and you be the pointer so that you show which way home is. Yesterday, we mentioned how Siding Spring Observatory discovered the oldest star. The oldest star we've discovered, 0313. How old is it? It's about 13.6 uh, billion years old. Um, the, the, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So this is a star that formed maybe 100 million to 200 million years after the Big Bang, one of the first stars in the universe. Now, it's visible in the southern sky. It's very faint, actually, but it's, about, we've got a, it's between the Magellanic Clouds, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. So on that photograph, if you draw a line between them, it's somewhat above that. Oh, actually, we put a nice circular That's graphic on That's there. That's not so the real thing. There, and we can zoom in there to take a look at this star, 0313. And how would, how would we tell how old it is? It's a good question. It's in the centre of that photograph. All we have is light, if you think about it. That's all astronomers have. But there's a lot of information carried in light. Um, if you look at the light from a star, you can pass it through a prism, essentially. So it's just like a rainbow. You pass white light through a prism, you get all the colours of the rainbow. But what you see when you pass starlight through a prism is that you see it's not a continuous rainbow. There are bits missing. And those bits missing at very specific colours correspond to different chemical elements in the star itself. See, I find this, this is probably my favourite thing maybe in all of science because it goes from the very tiny to the very, very huge. Just so people could ever understand that just at, at the smallest of levels, their elements are, have a, a nucleus and they have electrons going, floating around them in various orbits. Yeah. If you bump energy into the electron, it'll jump up an orbit. Yeah. So it'll absorb a certain energy, but it'll also drop back and emit energy. Yeah. So every element, because those orbits are unique to the element, every element has a unique kind of signature, yeah, colour signature. Colour signature tells you about the structure of the elements themselves. And we've got, uh, we've got a, I was going to say, a diagram. It yeah. is a demonstration. So if I light that... And what one are you like? You're lighting this, this? This has got boron in it, the element boron. Right. This is strontium. And this is more commonly people have seen yeah. this before. This is copper chloride. You see that? That's rather beautiful. So we've got green there, red there and yellowy green here. So you see the signatures of those elements. This is what you see in the starlight. The thing about that oldest star though, 0313, is you look at it and it's a very pure star. It is essentially only hydrogen and helium, a little bit of lithium, nothing else. Now those elements were made at the Big Bang. The heavier elements, so strontium or iron, carbon and oxygen, the elements out of which we are made, are made in the cores of stars. So you need generations of stars to take the, the primordial hydrogen and helium, if you like, convert them into the heavier elements. They get incorporated into younger stars like the sun and you see that in the spectrum of the light. So if you see a star that has not got iron or oxygen or carbon or any of the heavier elements, you know that it formed very early on in the history of the universe, and that's how we date stars. And very quickly, this is different to the starlight itself looking blue or looking red. Oh, yeah, so when you see colours in stars, like Betelgeuse, so go out tonight after the show, look at Orion. We've said that after every show, I think. The top left hand, hand star in the UK, it's red. Why is it red? Because it's cool. So that's the temperature of the star. But we're talking about the, the colours in the spectrum when you pass the light through a prism. That's how you see what elements are in. That's beautiful, that. Isn't it's it's warm, warm as well, warm I can yourself say. Warm yourself at my strontium fire. That's nice. <laughs> New science fiction novel. Uh, fire. Let's see what's happening with Liz and Greg. 
Would you mind throwing a bit of that flame our way? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, actually, we don't mind being here, even though it's a little bit cold, we're under this and it's just a glorious sight as ever. Uh, we've got some more questions for Space Gandalf. Actually, do you mind us, everybody on Twitter and everybody else, calling you Space Gandalf? <laughs> Call me whatever you like, Good it's man. fine. Good man. Are you ready for a couple of questions? Sure. Yeah, I love questions. <laughs> we've been talking a lot about what we can only see here in the southern skies, but Jules on Twitter wants to know why we can see constellations like Orion from both hemispheres. Oh, great question. And the answer is, Orion sits above the equator of the Earth. It sits on the equator in the sky, or the celestial equator. And that means people from both hemispheres can see it easily. OK. And then you've got other constellations and objects that are a little bit further away from that equator that you might be able to see on both. And then the further you, the further you or the closest you yeah. get to the poles, then the northern hemisphere won't get to see the southern hemisphere objects and vice versa. Yeah, there's a, there's a particular line depending on where you are on the planet. Especially there'll be a circle right. in the sky where you won't see the stars, yeah. and there'll be a circle in the sky where you will always see those stars and they won't go below the horizon. Lovely. very interesting. And those stars are circumpolar. Yeah, yeah, the ones right at the poles. Uh, Luke Gregory wants to know, what nebula do you think is the most beautiful? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Wow, there's so many choices. But what would I pick? I mean, there's the Orion Nebula, the Tarantula Nebula, I think I'm going to pick the Swan Nebula. Ooh, mm. we haven't spoken about that one yet. Tell no, me about no, it. No, we haven't. I've, I've only just thought about it just then. The Swan <laughs> Nebula, also known as the Omega Nebula, actually. We've got um, an image of it, actually, just for straight our viewers. Up, straight overhead. It's right above us, yep. but we have an image for you. And can you describe, well, is it sort of obvious when you look at the image why it's called a Swan Nebula? Well, I'm looking at it now, and, and you can see the the body of the swan sitting on the water. Yeah. It's all of the white area in this particular nebula. So for a change, it's, it's a white one as opposed to the dark nebula, like the coal sack yep. um, and the other dark shapes on um, the and emu of the Milky Way. That's it. And the piece on the left that comes up and around, that's his head. OK, beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for that, Greg. And you know, it's <laughs> wonderful to think that in these star forming regions, in these nebulae, are solar systems being born, capable of potentially supporting extraterrestrial life. It's probably the most compelling quest in astronomy. And of course, Mars is a top contender in that search. Now, in 2020, NASA is launching a mission to send their next rover to the Red Planet. And for the first time, they will be searching specifically for signs of microbial life, as well as habitable conditions from billions of years ago. But for the best chance to find it, where should they land the rover? Mars, an endless red desert. In a landscape like this, finding evidence of ancient life might seem an impossible challenge. But it wouldn't be the first time scientists have done it. In Australia's remote northwest, the Pilbara is a region of arid outback that looks uncannily like the surface of Mars, even down to its rust red sands full of iron ore. Oof, it's spectacular. Welcome to the Pilbara. Some heat, though. Yeah, it's a little mild summer day, about 39 or so. For over 20 years, Professor Martin van Kranendonk has painstakingly searched these desolate hills. Gosh, this is magnificent. Yeah. For evidence of Earth's earliest life. What makes the Pilbara so special then? Well, the Pilbara is just one of these flukes of nature, one of those magical little spots that have just stayed like it was three and a half billion years ago. So we can investigate early Earth like we were there. The rocks here are a time capsule from an age when life was just beginning to get a foothold on our planet. I'll just uh, collect a piece here. I think this is a really exciting place to look for signs of life. But it's not just life on Earth that Martin is seeking clues to here in the Pilbara. The rocks here are the same age as much of the crust on Mars. And so by coming here and studying the environments, on early Earth, we can think about the environments on early Mars and make the connections. So on early Earth, where do you find life? Let's go to Mars and look for those same environments. Around three and a half billion years ago, when life may first have emerged on Earth, 
it's thought that Mars had a very similar climate with an atmosphere and liquid water. So there's every chance life could have emerged there in just the same way. And if it did, Martin thinks any ancient life he finds here in the Pilbara could help lead us to it. You can see these beautiful circular structures made up of many, many little layers. These particular curves here or this circle, what, exactly. what are you focusing on? There's a whole variety of shapes here that we can explain by normal geology processes like just water moving sediment. This is a clear hallmark of biology. But these aren't fossils as I would know them. They're not remains of actual animals, are they? These structures are called stromatolites. A stromatolite is actually a rock term. Okay. It's a structure in the rock. And they're basically the apartment buildings of tiny microbes, millions and millions of them, all living together. And the microbes make the structures in the rocks three and a half billion years ago. These really represent the ancestors for all of life on Earth. These are our great, 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 great <laughs> grandmothers and grandfathers. This is the beginning of everything that we know about life on Earth. And really, it also is our touchstone for understanding where we might be able to go to search for life on Mars. When the next Mars rover lands and begins its mission in 2021, Martin believes these are the signs of life it should be looking for. That's because the climate changed so quickly on Mars, it's unlikely emerging life developed any further. But it still leaves the question, where should the new Mars rover focus its search? Most sites that NASA has considered are ancient Martian lakes and shallow riverbeds, because the first life on Earth is believed to have evolved underwater. But last year, Martin discovered something here in the Pilbara that challenges that fundamental idea. So this is really the area that I, I wanted to show you. Yeah. You've got this massive unit right at your knees here that comes around in a big swirl. This is the remnant of a hot spring pool. And we have some of the earliest life on land in freshwater springs. Where's the evidence of the stromatolites here? It's just up here in these little black layered rocks. Can you see there's this one layer? These are microstromatolites. They're quite different looking to the ones we saw before. That's right. So in early Earth, we have different habitats. And here in the hot spring setting, totally different features. How much of a game changer is this <laughs> for our understanding of the beginnings of life on Earth? Well, so this area has been studied for 30 years, and we never knew this until just this last year. But it has huge implications, not only for how life evolved on Earth, but also for where to search for life on Mars. This discovery marks a turning point for the next Mars mission. Rather than limiting the search to ancient Martian waterways, NASA can now look on land too, around ancient hot springs. That little black patch there, that's a really interesting patch that's got sulfides. And Martin thinks he knows exactly where they should go. The Spirit rover has already been to a site where they found hot spring deposits with textures that look a little bit lifelike. So we're really, really excited about the chance to go back there. After decades scouring this barren landscape, Martin's discoveries could now help NASA choose the best place to send their next Mars rover and could yet make a historic contribution to the search for life on Mars. Exciting spring is famous for many things, but uh, particularly for bringing colour to the solar system. The images they had here introduced in a way that hadn't been seen before. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a beautiful image of the Horsehead Nebula, as you see there. I mean, th these are the images that I sort of grew up with, actually. Many people grew up with these spectacular images in astronomy books. And I should say that I'm delighted to have David Mail in here, who, um, for those who don't know, know, don't know actually, when we've been here, young, several young astronomers have come through and they wanted their photograph taken with you. So I should say to the viewers how <laughs> legendary you are because you are the first to develop that te technique in the 1980s to produce those beautiful photographs. So how did you do it? Well, thank you very much for that kind, kind remark. Uh, yes, well, well, I did it because the director said he wanted some colour pictures to put this shiny new telescope on the map. All right. <laughs> uh, but I knew about colour theory, I knew about um, 
uh, James Clark Maxwell making his, making his three colour images and realised that we were making three colour pictures here but not producing the colour images from them. So we took three plates in red, green and blue light separately, black and white plates, capturing red, green and blue light, made positive uh, films from them and put them in an enlarger and enlarged them onto colour film using red, green and blue filters and rebuilt the colour picture in that way, but taking great care to get the, get the colours right so they were accurate, as what, what, what the eye would see if it was a million times more sensitive to faint light. So you, you only had black and white film, but you came up with these... These was, it, was there no colour film that could do this? No, colour film wasn't sensitive enough. Right. You, you could get colour pictures, but they were rather feeble-looking things. They weren't... They were, colours weren't strong, and, and these colours are very saturated because they're uh, emission line objects, they're... they're like the colours you, you saw in your demonstration, yeah. they're really strong colours, and colour films don't do, do that very well. This, this is what you'd see. And I wanted, I wanted to put this picture about this beautiful image of the four different coloured stars, which I think you said is one of your favourite images. Oh, it is. It's a fantastic so image, Can you this. talk us through this image? Yes, yes, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a part of the sky um, in Scorpius. It, uh, on the right-hand side, there's a very bright star, Antares. You can easily see it with the naked eye. It's a red giant star. It's throwing off dust, and the dust is surrounding the star, and the star itself is lighting that dust, so the, the dust is reflecting the star's light. You can see the yellow colour from the star doing that. If you look at the right-hand side of the picture, there's a much hotter star, uh, and it's also embedded in dust, but the dust there is not reflecting the light, it's scattering the light in much the same way that the atoms and molecules in the Earth's atmosphere scatter the sunlight, making the sky blue. So that's why that's blue. Yeah. At the bottom of the picture, there's a very hot star shining its light into a cloud of dust which has got hydrogen in it, and hydrogen uh, fluoresces in the way that the chemicals you saw earlier in the programme fluoresce from the hot energy, the uh, ultraviolet light from the hot star, making the hydrogen for us. So all the colours are there. And right in the centre of the photograph, at the back, hiding the stars, there's a dark cloud. That's another kind of nebula, a dark nebula. That's the dust hiding the light oh, yeah. of the stars beyond. See it there, it's utterly spectacular and beautiful. We've got some, um, so, some images that some of our viewers have taken, actually, which I wonder whether you could look at. Um, this is a, a, the, oh, the Rosette that. Nebula yes. from Don Kerry. I mean, that, that's a... That is again, that's really very good, I must say. That's a narrowband image, I can tell you what it is. It's probably taken in edge half a light of the Rosette Nebula, really crisp and sharp, very good contrast. Uh, that's taken in red light, I think, but he's yeah. coloured it green in the way the Hubble telescope, telescope does, so you, can see to, the, so you can see the detail better. See the structure. And I've got one more, actually, which is a photograph of solar activity by Alistair Woodward. She's a beautiful Ah, yes, picture. solar so, fla flaculi, they're great. That's a very nice picture, too, showing that we had magnetic field structure on the surface of the sun. Beautiful. How, would, how should we start? I mean, I, I did the fir my first ever piece of astrophotography here. I you, brought a camera on the way here because I, I couldn't miss the opportunity to do this. How would you recommend <laughs> well, people Well, you were start? showing me your pictures and you're very good for a beginner. For, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that's the way to start. You start by look, buying a camera and taking some pictures, just trying it. And, and then get, you buy a tripod and put it on the tripod and take deeper pictures. And you become interested in it, as you are. And then you buy a telescope. And then you're and sunk. And just keeps going up and up. It keeps going and up and up. Sunk. Then you're sunk. But then you, you talk to real astronomers. You join an astronomy club or you're, you find some amateurs who are using telescopes. And there, there's your future. Oh, thank you. Uh, a big thank hug to all of our much. astrophotographers and to everyone who's enjoying star parties across the UK in tandem with this programme. Telescopes deliver beautiful pictures throughout the night, but we're moving into dawn in about 30 minutes. So how do you continue to observe once the sun has come up? Well, there's one telescope here that has a clever solution. Thank you very much. Emerging from this pretty impressive clamshell dome is a telescope that's part of an 18 strong global network of instruments and because it's a network it's capable of doing things no single telescope here can do. This two metre telescope along with a handful of smaller ones belong to Las Cumbres Observatory. The observatory operates from eight sites around the world and Mark Willis is one of the technicians responsible for maintaining this vast network. So what makes the Las Cumbres Observatory Network so special? Because we have telescopes all over the world, we can track an object 24 hours a day, constantly around the globe. The network of telescopes act as a single instrument, with observations passing from one site to another in a relay. 
Each site is automated, so keeping them operational requires some serious technology. So this is what I do. Whoa, okay. And it's just for this one telescope. It's just us, this one meter behind me. But some parts of Mark's job are a little easier to get your head around. So one of my other jobs I have to do is called snow cleaning the mirror. Snow cleaning? Snow cleaning the mirror. So this is liquid CO2. Would you like to have a go? What if I do it wrong? I trust you. How much does this telescope cost? Maybe a few million. I'll show you where to point it. Big mistake, Mark. Big mistake. Pull the trigger. Keep going. Keep going. You gotta do the secondary mirror as the well. The power is going to my head. <laughs> Take that, secondary mirror. Yeah, I see why it's called snow cleaning now. Because these telescopes can monitor the night sky around the clock, one of their specialities is to track objects that move over time. This unique network can track targets for days, things like space junk and asteroids. Tracking asteroids over long periods of time allows astronomers to calculate their exact size and their trajectory, which is crucial when you want to find out if one of them might collide with the Earth in future. So we asked Las Cumbres Observatory to track an asteroid for us. And here it is, 24 hours in the life of asteroid Florence, named after Florence Nightingale, no less. It's traveled 34,000 miles in those 24 hours. It's traveling in the southeasterly direction, halfway between Saturn and the horizon at the moment. It measures two and a half miles across, and it's classed as a potentially hazardous near-Earth object. Now, the more Las Cumbres tracks an asteroid, the more they can refine its spin rate, and therefore its exact orbit. Orbit. And so we know that Florence will pass close to the Earth on the 1st of September of this year, the closest it's been to us since 1890, at just over 4 million miles. So Florence doesn't pose any real threat now, but the thing is, space is a dynamic place. As an asteroid travels past planets and moons, it can get diverted from its current course because of their gravity and come dangerously close to our planet, which is why Las Cumbres is so very important and why it will be keeping a very close eye on asteroids like Florence for a long time to come. It's important, asteroid defence. It is very important, actually. They're, they're, a, they're a serious threat. There are two things, probably, that might destroy our entire civilization. One is our own stupidity, by which I mean a, a nuclear war. Uh, the other one, probably, uh, is, a, is a big... Well, probably, but the other way you could do it was a big asteroid hit. I want to show you this video, actually, from Russia. It was uh, February 2013. This is an image from a, a car of a 12,000-tonne uh, asteroid entering the Earth's atmosphere a 12,000 tonne piece of rock. That exploded with the force of 30 Hiroshima bombs. Um, fortunately, very high in the atmosphere. You can imagine if that had come in at a different angle, it could have caused significant damage. The Russian foreign minister, actually the foreign affairs committee chief said on Twitter, uh, instead of fighting here on Earth, people should be creating a joint system of asteroid defence. And I strongly believe that. It's unlikely, but at some point we will be threatened by a big asteroid. I mean, we've been hit many times before. And yeah. uh, now, if I look up into the galactic heart of the galactic centre, I'm looking into the heart of the galaxy, which means I'm looking straight at a supermassive black hole, 26,000 light years away. Yeah, the trouble is, though, you can't see a black hole almost by definition. So how do we know they're there? For decades, astronomers believed that the only view we'd ever get of a black hole would be from the imagination of filmmakers. But modern astronomy has proved them wrong. This image from the first black hole ever to be identified shows a glowing jet of X-ray radiation spewing out as it feasts on a passing star. Evidence like this is rare. Even so, we now believe that supermassive black holes exist at the center of every galaxy, including our own. The first strong evidence that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way came from a 10-year study of a population of stars orbiting close to the galactic center. Now, from the details of these orbits, we can tell they're orbiting around something that is very small, very massive, and therefore very dense. But 
we can't see it. It looks as if there's nothing there. And we can calculate the mass of this thing. And it turns out that it's around four million times the mass of the sun. It could only be a supermassive black hole. But there's one thing that seems to be missing from our black hole. There is no sign of any of the radiation and x-rays you might expect to be emitted from the vicinity if there's gas and dust falling into it. So I suppose that's a bit disappointed in a way. I mean, far from being the star-eating monster of science fiction, our black hole seems to be rather dormant and peaceful. But in 2011, astronomers made a stunning discovery. It appeared that the sleeping giant was about to wake. During a routine search through data, astronomers in Munich glimpsed this mysterious object. Now, it's not very really massive, about three times the mass of the Earth. It's probably a cloud of gas and dust, but it was heading directly towards the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Astronomers speculated as to what this might look like. They predicted that the cloud would be pulled apart by the intense gravity of the black hole, causing X-rays and gamma rays to spew violently out into space. Everyone with a telescope big enough got ready to watch the show. There was a lot of excitement about the cloud falling towards the black hole because this could be the first time that we've ever been able to watch what happens when a black hole eats something. Dr. Lisa Harvey-Smith studies black holes using the Australia Compact Telescope Array. And this was an opportunity too good to miss. Events like this that you can watch live are so exciting in astronomy because usually we're watching things that happened millions of years ago. This is really a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. As Lisa waited, astronomers ran simulations to try to predict what would happen. Black hole science had reached fever pitch. And as the world watched, the gas cloud sailed straight past. Well, despite having all these telescopes around the world and even in space trained on this event, unfortunately, we saw pretty much nothing. And that was a bit of a puzzle at the time, a bit of a disappointment for everyone. Perhaps our black hole wasn't all that it was made out to be. But then, just as the world began to turn away, a team from NASA brought our black hole back into sharp focus. The Chandra X-ray telescope had been observing the black hole in the months following the predicted collision. But it took the astronomers some time to analyze the data that they published in January 2015. And they saw two sudden bright bursts of X-rays emanating from the black hole. Sadly, the timing was out. The astronomers found they occurred two months after the gas cloud was predicted to collide. And there's currently no scientific consensus as to whether they are linked to the gas cloud or not. However, our black hole may be about to do something spectacular. Well, there's a really exciting event coming up, luckily. Next year, there's a very massive star that we know is orbiting around the black hole. This is, again, a once-in-a-lifetime event. We don't get to see things passing close to black holes very often. So, once again, the world's telescopes will be focused on a spot 25,000 light-years from Earth. I think our black hole has a lot of secrets yet to unfold, so we'll all be watching very closely. Lisa has joined us just as dawn is beginning to emerge. You can see yeah. the mountain range coming out of the darkness behind us here. It's about 10 to 7 here. Uh, you're excited about this collision. What's going to happen? 
Well, this star is pretty big. It's 15 times the mass of our sun and it's traveling incredibly fast. Now, its orbit's taking it around in a 15-year cycle. So it goes very far away from the black hole and then very close. It's approaching its closest point next year. And at that point, it'll be accelerated to about 5,000 kilometers per second. Just think about that for a minute. And it's 15 times the mass of the sun. It is, yeah. It's a huge, Violent. gigantic star. So it's, it's quite easy to see and measure its orbit. So what, what do we hope to see as that star approaches the black hole and then sweeps around it? Well, there's some really interesting predictions about um, strong gravitational fields in Einstein's theory of general relativity. This is a theory that describes how gravity works, and, and we use this all throughout physics. Um, as the star gets really, really close, it'll start to interact with the very strong gravitational field of the black hole, and then some really weird stuff starts to happen. Um, a couple of predictions are that the starlight will get much redder, well, not much redder, but we'll be able to measure the slight reddening of the, the starlight. And that will tell us about the strength of the gravitational field and about whether Einstein's theory is, is really correct. Yeah, I suppose one of the ridiculous things that will happen is time will slow down on that star <laughs> yeah. as we watch. When it's, it's really extreme, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, you know, just sitting here on Earth, your feet, time's going slower for your feet than for your head. Yeah. And, and that's in an extreme gravitational environment like a black hole. That's just incredibly uh, marked. How well, clear a view do we get of this? Well, um, it's great because you can't see it with your eyes at all because the black hole is black, but also the environment around it is very dusty. It's like very cloudy. So we look with infrared eyes or, or X-ray uh, telescopes uh, and we can actually see through all that stuff. Now, we do have some evidence that something interesting happened to that rather placid black hole well, about five or six billion years ago or so. I've got a, an image, actually, which is a, an image of our Milky Way. And this is a, an artist's impression of some real data. And the interesting thing, so you see in the band of the Milky Way across the centre of the image we've been looking at across the sky, but those big lobes that are coloured pink there, what are those and what do they tell us about our black hole's history? Well, they're incredible, aren't they? They were discovered only about uh, 2010. And it was a really unexpected discovery because we see these things in other galaxies, very active galaxies that have black holes that are eating a lot of material. But we thought our black hole was very dormant. It was just hibernating. In fact, these bubbles that have been blown out of the galaxy above and below the galactic plane show that about six million years ago, our galaxy had a meal that was about 100 thousand times the mass of our sun. So it started eating a lot of material <laughs> all at once and it burped. Six, six billion, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was six, six billion. No, six million. Six million? Yeah, it's very oh, right. recent. Oh, so six million. Very recent, So it's yeah. a recent thing. And I just wanted to pick this up. We've just got time to show this image, which is, a, an, again, an artist's impression of what the Event Horizon project might see. And this looks like a black hole. It's so incredible, what, yeah. I mean, you can see the black hole in the middle, obviously, but you can see all this light around it, and that's st light stretched by gravitational lensing, an effect where gravity actually smears and stretches light around massive objects. This is the Event Horizon Telescope, which is up and running. It's expected to be um, looking very close to the event horizon of that supermassive black hole uh, around the end of this year. And it's made up of a global array of different radio it's telescopes all working together. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much, Lisa. Cheers. The sun will soon be rising here. As I said, you can see it lightening up around us. Uh, uh, but for Indigenous Australians, the sun has a special significance. Here's Gilar Michael Anderson again. Yai um, in our culture means sun, the, the sun. So she's the one that keeps the fires burning and keeps everything warm for the planet and for all nature to be able to grow. Yai is the fourth wife of Baimi. Baimi is the creator. He's the male creator. The equivalent, I guess, in the Christian world of God. Yai is also in love, and she always has been in love with Balu, the moon. These two have always had a secret admiration for each other. Many times she gets very angry and then she lets off this massive heat radiations that we feel on the earth here, which is rage at her anger at not having the freedom to be able to go with her lover. Since Tuesday, a mini army of stargazing live viewers has been hunting for a planet in our solar system that's thought to exist beyond Neptune, but it has yet undiscovered. Chris Lintot, or Clint Liftoff, who are you tonight? Who can tell? <laughs> uh, what's been found so far? Well, we haven't found Planet Nine, 
But we did find lots of other interesting things. More than four million views of our images have come in, and it was immediately obvious that we were finding lots of unknown things in the sky. So we were checking through, and first of all, we were looking for moving things, and we found things we expected. Yeah. So the dots in the bottom here, left actually. here, the coloured dots, that's Chiron that you can see there, which is a large well, asteroid with that. rings. Yeah. So this thing is a large asteroid discovered in the 70s, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, out by we... Uranus, so it's what's called a centaur. So we found that, so we're looking in the outer solar system. Yeah. And then we started noticing asteroids that had a nasty habit of lining up. So we keep finding images with one, two, three asteroids in a straight line. The pictures yeah. we showed last night, for example, that turned out turned not out to, to be... Turned out to be two asteroids faking, doing a good impression but, of Planet but, Nine. We should say, though, we've got some candidates for objects they're unknown. That's right, yeah. And so we've got the telescopes pointing so, out. So finding these known things is good because it tells you it's working. And then we've got a pile of unknown things. And the next stage is to follow up with telescopes. But the um, poor weather, the rain and the wind defeated us. But we have done science. That's the important thing. Yeah. And here's the scientific result on your iPad. So right. in the centre there, those white circles, those are the orbits of the outer planets with Neptune on the outer edge. And the green bits... Those are the areas of the sky that we can now say that there isn't a large planet nine hiding. So that's in. interesting because that, that, that outer ring is Neptune's orbit, so it's a long way out. That's right. The outer reaches of the solar system, we've said it is not there anywhere that's green. We can also actually the wind's getting up. We can look at the southern hemisphere sky. Yes, yeah, so you're looking well. side on there, and you can see we concentrated on the south because no one had looked there before. Yeah, so there that's is. our result. Sometimes science is about saying what we. Don't, don't know. Me. And so we know that there isn't a large planet there. Either the planet's smaller than expected or it's further out. But right. the search continues. Search continues. We've got new data up at planet9search.org. We need more help and we'll be following up on the discoveries with telescopes here and elsewhere yeah, so in the next week so or so. So we should say, if you're watching BBC viewers, uh, on the sky at night or something, as soon as we find, uh, follow up on those observations, we will let you know because they are exciting things. And we, we haven't entirely ruled out Planet Nine no. yet. That's no, an no, important no. thing to all, say. All we've done, this is science, we've, we had a hypothesis, there was a planet there, we looked for it, we didn't find it, and so we refine the hypothesis and yeah. we keep looking. Thanks, it Chris. would have been great to have announced it on Tuesday and then had it by Thursday, but let's not get carried away with ourselves. With dawn Good breaking science. and the telescopes of sightings been closing after another night of stargazing, it's almost the end of our stargazing adventure too. Here are some of our favourite moments. Hello and welcome to the second night of Stargazing Live Australia with myself and Sadara Attenborough, hopping mouse guru. Thank you, Postman Pat's friend. And it is ludicrously easy to capture wildlife there, some of the giant bouncing mice, but they seem to gather around the observatories and just dance around them, orbit them. Look, Dara Attenborough, it's a bush moth. He's made friends <laughs> with my chuck. I've been working in that big telescope dome there for so many years, I'm starting to look like it. There's a view out during the day, and then when the night falls, it just turns spectacular. Wow. You see that it's a swarm of stars. So that's yes. the head of the emu. The neck comes down this way. It's huge. Somewhere there. <laughs> Can't see them. One of us is upside down, and I'm not sure if it's you or me. Greg is the most Australian person we could possibly have found. <laughs> so so yeah. Someone said he was a member of ZZ Top. Or Aussie, Aussie, Aussie Gandalf. <laughs> really heralding the dawn. Don't fly away on me now, Greg. <laughs> Liz and Greg have joined us. Uh, Greg, it's been a pleasure to have you here. What's been your highlight of the last few nights? Oh, Dara, I think working alongside Liz has been one of my highlights, <laughs> but also showing Brian Omega Centauri for the first time in a oh, telescope. Th th that, was, that was my highlight. I've always wanted to see that, seeing that through a telescope with, with Greg. Absolutely true. Liz? Other feelings mutual, really getting to understand the southern skies with Greg has been an utter privilege. So say something that's not yeah. Greg. Well, the, the <laughs> excitement in the room when these candidates came in, we said, this might be it, and then we ran around and chased these targets down, and there'll be lots more of yeah. that. And for me, it's taking photographs. Taking photographs, which people do, is the most straightforward part of astronomy yeah. as an amateur, I, I, and, and getting to for the first time. I love yeah. the fact we've been renamed as well. We've got Space Gandalf, Moth Lady, Clint, <laughs> Lift, Lift Off, <laughs> Sir <laughs> Dara, Attenborough. And Postman Pat. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's been a fantastic a trip from Siding Spring. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you again soon, I'm sure. From all yeah. of us here, good morning Bye. and good night. Good night. <laughs> this fire.
Condemned to a life of slavery, can anyone rescue Uhtred before it's too late? The Last Kingdom, next.